Chapter 13 of Savarine's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. Savarine's Disappearance. Chapter 13 coals of fire. The gloomy month of November, 1859, was drawing to its close. The weather, as usual at that time of the year, was dull and sober, and the skies were dark and lowering. More than three months had elapsed since the journey to New York, and Mrs. Savarine and her affairs had ceased to be the engrossing topics of discussion among the people of Millbrook and its neighborhood. She continued to live a very secluded life, and seldom stirred beyond the threshold of her own door. Almost her only visitors were her father and brother, for her stepmother rarely intruded upon her domain, and indeed was not much encouraged to do so, as her presence never brought comfort with it. The little boy continued to grow apace, and it seemed to the fond mother that he became dearer to her every day. He was the sole light and joy of her life, and in him were bound up all her hopes for the future. Of late she had ceased to scan his features in the hope of tracing there some resemblance of his absent father. Since her visit to Amity Street, that fond illusion had wholly departed never to return. She had ceased even to speak to him about his other parent, and had begun to regard herself in the light of an actual widow. Such was the state of affairs when the humdrum of her existence was broken in upon by a succession of circumstances which it now becomes necessary to unfold. It was rapidly drawing towards six o'clock in the evening, and the darkness of night had already fallen upon the outer landscape. Mrs. Savarine sat in her little parlor with her boy upon her knee, as it was her custom to sit at this hour. The lamp had not been lighted, but the fireplace sent forth a ruddy blaze, making the countless shadows reflect themselves on the floor, and in the remote corners of the room. To both the boy and the child, this hour, between the dark and the daylight, was incomparably the most delightful of the twenty-four, for it was consecrated to story-telling. Then it was that the boy was first introduced to those old-time legends which in one form or another have thrilled the bosoms of happy childhood for so many hundreds of years, and which will continue to thrill them through centuries yet unborn. Then it was that he made the acquaintance of Little Red Riding Hood, Jack the Giant Killer, and the seven champions of Christendom. The mingled lights and shades from the blazing logs of hickory in the fireplace lent additional charm to the thousand and one stories which the mother recounted for the child's edification. And I doubt not that Jack's wonderful beanstalk is still associated in Master Reggie's mind with that cozy little room with its blended atmosphere of cheerful twilight and somber shadow. A few minutes more and it would be tea time. It would never do, however, to break off the story of the babes in the wood just at the time when the two emissaries of the wicked uncle began to quarrel in the depths of the forest. The child's sympathies had been thoroughly aroused, and he would not tamely submit to be left in suspense. No, the gruesome old tale must be told out, or at least as far as where the robin redbreasts, after mourning over the fate of the hapless infants, did cover them with leaves. And so the mother went on with the narrative. She had just reached the culminating point when an approaching footstep was heard outside. Then came a knock at the door, followed by the entrance of Mrs. Savarine's father. It was easy to see from his face that this was no mere perfunctory call. Evidently he had news to tell. "'Something has happened, father?' said Mrs. Savarine, as calmly as she could. Well, yes, something has happened. It is nothing very dreadful, but you had 
better prepare yourself to hear unpleasant news. It is that man. He has come. Yes, he has come to town. Is he at the door? No, he is at my house. I thought I had better come over and tell you, instead of letting him come himself and take you by surprise. What has he come for, and what does he want? inquired Mrs. Savareen in a harder tone of voice than she was accustomed to use. Well, for one thing he wants to see you, and I suppose you can't very well avoid seeing him. He is your husband, you know. He knows nothing about the journey to New York. He has no means and looks shabby and sickly. I shouldn't wonder if he isn't long for this world. So you didn't tell him anything about the New York trip? No. I didn't exactly know what your views might be, and he looked such a worn-out, pitiful object that I held my tongue about it. I think you had better see him and hear what he has to say. It appeared that Savareen had arrived at Millbrook by the 4.15 p.m. train from New York, and that he had slunk round by the least frequented streets to his father-in-law's house without being recognized by anyone. It might be doubted, indeed, whether any of his old friends would have recognized him, even if they had met him face to face in broad daylight, for he was by no means the ruddy, robust, self-complacent-looking personage that they had been accustomed to see in the old days, when he was wont to ride into town on his black mare. His clothes were seamy and worn, and his physical proportions had shrunk so much that the shabby garments seemed a world too wide for him. His face, which three months ago had been bloated and sodden, had become pale and emaciated, and the scar upon his left cheek seemed to have developed until it was the most noticeable thing about him. His step was feeble and tremulous, and it was evident that his health had completely broken down. He was, in fact, in a state bordering on collapse, and was hardly fit to be going about. His financial condition was on a par with his bodily state. He had expended his last dime in the purchase of his railway ticket, and at the moment of reaching his father-in-law's door, he had been well-nigh famished for want of food. When a loaf of bread and some slices of cold meat had been set before him, he had fallen to with the voracity of a jungle tiger. He had vouchsafed no explanation of his presence, except that he felt he was going to die, and that he wanted to see his wife and child. As he was tired out and sorely in need of rest, he had been put to bed, and his father-in-law, after seeing him snugly stowed away between the sheets, had set out to bear the news to his wife. There could be no doubt as to what was the proper thing to be done. Mrs. Savareen made the fire safe, put on her bonnet and shawl, and locked up the house. Then, taking her little boy by the hand, she accompanied her father to the old house where, six or seven years before, the handsome young farmer had been in the habit of visiting and paying court to her. On arriving, she found the invalid buried in the deep, profound sleep of exhaustion. Consigning her boy to the care of her stepmother, she took her place by the bedside and waited. Her vigil was a protracted one, for the tired-out sleeper did not awaken until the small hours of the next morning. Then, with a long-drawn respiration, he opened his eyes and fixed them upon the watcher with a weak, wandering expression, as though he was unable to fully grasp the situation. The truth found its way to him by degrees. He shifted himself uneasily, as though he would have been glad to smother himself beneath the bedclothes, was it not for a lack of resolution. A whipped hound never presented a more abject appearance. His wife was the first to speak. "'Do you feel rested?' she asked in a gentle tone. "'Rested? Oh, yes, I remember now. We are at your father's.' Yes, but don't talk any more just now, if it tires you. Try to go to sleep again. 
You are good to me, better than I deserve, he responded after a pause. Then great tears welled up to his eyes and coursed one after another down his thin, worn face. It was easy to see that he was weak as water. His long journey by rail without food had been too much for him, and in his state of health it was just possible he might never rally. The womanly nature of the outraged wife came uppermost, as it always does under such circumstances. Her love for the miserable creature lying there before her had been killed and crucified long ago, never to be revived. But she could not forget that she had once loved him, and that he was the father of her child. No matter how deeply he had wronged her, he was ill and suffering, perhaps dying. His punishment had come upon him without any act of hers. She contrasted his present bearing with that of other days. He was bent, broken, crushed, nothing there to remind her of the stalwart, manly young fellow whose voice had once stirred her pulse to admiration and love. All the more reason why she should be good to him now, all undeserving as he might be. Our British Homer showed a true appreciation of the best side of feminine nature when he wrote, O woman, in our hour of ease, uncertain, coy, and hard to please, when pain and anguish wring thy brow, a ministering angel thou. She rose and approached the bed, while her gaze rested mildly upon his face. Drawing forth her handkerchief, she wiped the salt tears from his cheeks with a caressing hand. To him, lying there in his helplessness, she seemed no unfit earthly representative of that divine beneficence whose blessed task, says Thackeray, it will one day be to wipe the tear from every eye. Her gentleness caused the springs to well forth afresh and the prostrate form was convulsed by sobs. She sat by his side on the bed and staunched the miniature flood with a tender touch. By and by, calm returned, and he sank into a profound and apparently dreamless sleep. When he again awoke, it was broad daylight. The first object on which his eyes rested was the patient watcher, who had never left her post the whole night long and who still sat in an armchair at his bedside, ready to minister to his comfort. As soon as she perceived that he was awake, she approached and took his wasted hand in her own. He gazed steadily in her face, but could find no words to speak. "'You are rested now, are you not?' she murmured, scarcely above her breath. After a while he found his voice, and asked how long he had slept, being enlightened on the point, he expressed his belief that it was time for him to rise. Not yet, was the response. You shall have your breakfast first, and then it will be time enough to think about getting up. I forbid you to talk until you have had something to eat, she added playfully. Lie still for a few minutes while I go and see about a cup of tea. And so saying, she left him to himself. Presently she returned, bearing a tray and eatables. She quietly raised him to a sitting posture and placed a large, soft pillow at his back. He submitted to her ministrations like a child. It was long since he had been tended with such care, and the position doubtless seemed a little strange to him. After drinking a cup of tea and eating several morsels of the good things set before him, he evidently felt refreshed. His eyes lost somewhat of their lackluster air of confirmed invalidism, and his voice regained a measure of its natural tone. When he attempted to rise and dress himself, however, he betrayed such a degree of bodily feebleness that his wife forbade him to make further exertions. He yielded to her importunities and remained in bed, which was manifestly the best place for him. He was pestered by no unnecessary questions to account for his presence, Mrs. Savareen rightly considering that it was for him to volunteer any explanations he might have to make whenever he felt equal to the task. 
After a while, his little boy was brought in to see his father, of whom he dimly remembered to have heard. His presence moved the sick man to further exhibitions of tearful sensibility, but seemed, on the whole, to have a salutary effect. Long absence and a vagabond life had not quenched the paternal instinct, and the little fellow was caressed with a fervor too genuine to admit of the possibility of its being assumed. Master Reggie received these ebullitions of affection without much corresponding demonstrativeness. He could not be expected to feel any vehement adoration for one whom he had never seen since his earliest babyhood, and whose very name for some months past had been permitted to sink out of sight. His artless prattle, however, was grateful in the ears of his father, who looked and listened as if entranced by sweet strains of music. His wasted, worse than wasted, past seemed to rise before him as the child's accents fell softly upon his ear, and he seemed to realize more than ever how much he had thrown away. In the course of the forenoon, Mrs. Savarine's stepmother took her place in the sick chamber, and she herself withdrew to another room, to take the rest of which she was by this time sorely in need. The invalid would not assent to the proposal to call in a physician. He declared that he was only dead tired, and that rest and quiet would soon restore him without medicine, in so far as any restoration was possible. And so the day passed. By the evening the wife again took her place at the bedside, and she had not been there long, ere her husband, voluntarily, began his chapter of explanations. His story was a strange one, but there was no room to doubt the truth of any portion of it. End of chapter 13 Reading by Bob Sage